Ever wonder what Christianity was like under the apostles? Here's Tony Bosserman to give you a glimpse into original Christianity. Your Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 that the end of a thing is better than its beginning, that the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. And yet we human beings think just the opposite. We see birth as beginning life and death ending it. So why do you think God inspired such statements to be written in the pages of your Bible? Well, when you think about it, on the day of your birth, you had no knowledge, no experience, and no awareness of being. But as you get towards the end of your life, you can look back on a host of accomplishments and achievements, all those wonderful relationships you built, and the contribution you've made to society. The same is true of our career. We begin as a novice, a greenhorn, an apprentice. But towards the end of our career, now we're the journeyman that everybody comes to look for and answer questions. So the same is true of Jesus Christ. The end of his life is better than its beginning. The day of his death is better than the day of his birth. Why? Because his death is the most important event in human history. It is through that death that we have forgiveness of sins. All of humanity was sitting on death row until Jesus Christ came to take our place. And so the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And that's why Jesus gave us the commemoration ceremony of his death called the Lord's Supper. And he says in John 6, verse 53, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's how important it is that we rehearse this event, his death, and remember the sacrifice that he's made on our behalf. In fact, the Apostle Paul was inspired to write in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So that's what we're supposed to do. There's no command in your Bible to celebrate his birth, but we are commanded to, again, commemorate his death. So it's not wrong to rehearse his birth. In fact, we do it on a regular basis in the fall when probably Jesus Christ was born. And we'll get into an explanation of that here in a little bit. But we do it without all the pagan accoutrements that have become associated with Christmas today. And we don't see ourselves as establishing a holy day or a festival in the process. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32, where it says, Whatever I, God, command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. And so we're not to add festivals, holy days, you know, great celebrations of worship. That's God's job, and God gave us the days and the festivals and the holy days that he wants us to observe. And so we have an historical example of someone actually doing this in Israel's history, and he was condemned for it. You may not know the story of Solomon and the fact that he had two sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and after Solomon's death, they got into a feud, and so Jeroboam basically took the ten tribes of the house of Israel, and Rehoboam took uh, the house of Judah. And so Jeroboam was very afraid that his people, his subjects, his citizens, would go back to Jerusalem because of the command to go up to Jerusalem and keep the feast. And so he came up with his own festivals, and it talks about it in 1 Kings chapter 12. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. And so he had no authority to do that, and God condemned him for it. And so we're not to add or subtract from God's commands and his instructions. God gives us rules and rituals to live by that help keep us in sync with him. We also have an example in historic Christianity, and that is in the 4th century during the Council of Nicaea, they came out with this statement, a decree. It said, quote, Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day. And so here in this edict, 
Uh, the Catholic Church basically added the day of worship called Sunday and deleted the day of worship called the Sabbath. And so Christianity, under the leadership of the Catholic hierarchy, no longer wanted to be associated with the Jewish people. And so they came up with their own day of worship and then added Halloween, Christmas, and Easter. But under what authority? You know, the Bible gives us the festivals and the holy days that we are to observe. In fact, the church was established on the day of Pentecost. So why would God establish the church on his feast of Pentecost, also called Feast of First Fruits? Why would he do that if they were done away with? And they're not. And of course, the early church observed them, and you can see this in the book of Acts and, of course, some of the epistles of Paul. You've probably heard of the Grinch that stole Christmas. Well, let me share with you an apostle that seems to steal Christmas as well when he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. And so the apostle Peter was trying to get people to cut themselves off from paganism and pagan influence. And paganism is simply all of the false religions that were observed and celebrated by all the different nations around her. And so God didn't want her. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, God tells Israel, don't look at the nations around you and see how they worship their gods and then you know, worship me that way. Now, God gives us the rules and the rituals he wants us to live by in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. And again, you'll find that the original Christians were observing these days. The Feast of Pentecost, Passover, you know, the Day of Atonement. And so they're all mentioned in the book of Acts. Now, one of the things that pagans choose to do is worship trees. And so down through the centuries... Uh, different peoples and religions have sanctified or set apart certain trees. I think of the Axis Mundi, and that's a tree that many people down through the ages have thought that was at the center of the earth, and it held up the dome over the earth, and so it was considered sacred. Some think in Japan of the Jumenju tree as sacred as well, because its fruit looks like faces of human beings. And the Kalpa tree in India Well, it is considered sacred because it's a wishing tree. If you go there, you can have a wish granted. We also have the Whispering Oak, which is mythologized in the Iliad and the Odyssey. And Achilles goes there, and as the wind goes through its leaves, it supposedly gave him a message and gave him wisdom and advice and guidance. And, of course, in this country, we have the fir tree, which has become the Christmas tree. But why was the fir tree chosen to become the symbol of Christ's birth? Well, if you do a little research, you'll find that fir tree needles were often burned and the incense there was considered to protect mother and child as mother was giving birth to a child from the demons and from any outside influence. And therefore, the Christmas tree became associated with the birth of Jesus Christ. So in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 21, it says, You shall not plant for yourself any tree as a wooden image near the altar which you build for yourself to the Lord your God. And so a living tree or one that is cut down out of the forest can become a wooden image. And so God says not to do that. And yet millions of Christians do. And so we have this from Jeremiah chapter 10. Verse 2, it says, Thus says the Lord, Do not learn the way of the Gentiles or the pagans, for the customs of the peoples are futile. Or one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammer so that it will not topple. And so again, if you study trees and the history of them in the Middle East as sacred objects, you're going to find that people throughout the Middle East did worship trees, and they'd bring them into their homes. And God says not to do so. He also says this in Deuteronomy chapter 12, You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods. 
on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. Did you hear that? We're not to worship God with such things as, again, evergreen trees or any of the other pagan accoutrements that have become associated with Christmas. The Yule log, the mistletoe, you know, all of these things come from pagan practices and God doesn't want us to use them in the worship of him. You know, if you go to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13 and verse 30, you're going to read this statement. Thus I, Nehemiah, cleansed them, Israel, of everything pagan. Have you been cleansed of everything pagan? Well, probably not. You know, some of us may not even understand or really realize the pagan influences in our lives, not only in terms of practices and rituals, but in terms of some of the things we believe. You know that the immortality of the soul is a pagan doctrine. It goes back to Plato. And yet the words immortal soul are not found in the pages of your Bible. So again, pagan influence is there all around us, and it does infect Christianity. And so, you know, why did this happen? Why did we get to the point where we were observing a birth of Christ with all of these pagan accoutrements? Well, the Catholic Church looked at a pagan Rome, and of course, paganism was the religion of Rome, and paganism really means just to worship the sun, the moon, the stars, and any created thing. And so this was the practice in the empire of Rome when, of course, Christianity became dominant and Constantine decided to make it the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so that's why it's called the Holy Roman Empire, because it was a combination of church and state. So we need to understand that the end of a thing is better than its beginning, and so God didn't give us any instruction to celebrate the birth of Christ, but he does give us a command to observe or commemorate his death. And again, it's not wrong to rehearse the birth of Christ, as long as we don't do it with all these accoutrements, and again, try to establish it as a holy day. And we also need to understand that we don't have the authority or the power to actually establish a holy day, do we? Now, that's God's power and authority alone. Only he can establish a holy day or a festival. And so we shouldn't add or subtract from God's word. You probably heard the saying that Jesus is the reason for the season. But do you understand or have you ever researched and figured out why the winter season became the time in which Jesus' birth was commemorated? Well, a lot of people don't know that story. And so we're going to take a look at that in detail right after this. No one would deny that a major part of the COVID-19 effect has been to bring an eerie silence over the earth throughout much of 2020. Empty streets, business offices, churches, schools, stadiums, and parks, with billions of people sheltering in place, have dramatically lowered the decibel level generated by human beings throughout the world. Another part of the COVID-19 effect has been to greatly curb people's activity levels, resulting in an unparalleled, restful state in cities and countries everywhere. In retrospect, the year 2020 may be dubbed the year the Earth stood still. What most people are not aware of is that this COVID-19 effect was foretold in advance over 2,500 years ago, and it is the first of eight major events to come. It was all revealed by the most accurate political forecaster in the history of mankind. Read Foretold and find out what's coming after the COVID-19 effect. To order your copy of Foretold the COVID-19 effect, visit originalchristianityreview.com or find us on Amazon. We've been talking about the biblical teaching that the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. And that is why that God gave us a command to commemorate the death of Jesus Christ, but gives us no instruction to commemorate his birth. The death of Jesus Christ, again, is the most important event in human history because it resulted in the forgiveness of sins and reconciling us to God the Father. So we need to rehearse it on a regular basis. 
And God gives us the annual uh, Lord's Supper so that we can rehearse the bread and the cup and the meaning of that and really be thankful to God Almighty for the sacrifice of his son. So you've all heard that Jesus is the reason for the season. But again, why was the winter season chosen to commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ? Well, it wasn't just picked at random from the four seasons. It was picked on purpose. Now, again, the Catholic Church looked at a pagan Roman Empire and said, you know, how can we bring some of these people into the Christian fold? Well, they saw that on December 25th, uh, pagans worshipped the sun, S-U-N. And, of course, they did this because it was the shortest day of the year. And, of course, you know, the sun was beginning to come back, and they wanted it to come back so it would grow their crops, etc. And they worshipped the sun as a god. Did you know that also there were pagan goddesses who were said to have brought forth a new god, on December 25th. And so Mithra and Astarte gave birth to gods on December 25th. And so that's why that day was chosen. And simply what they did was convince the people that uh, the son that was born on that day that's important for you to know is Jesus Christ. And so that's why it became associated with that date. So the nativity or birth of the sun was connected by many pagan religions with the birth of the sun on the winter solstice. And so according to the Bible, Jesus wasn't really born in the winter time. And we can surmise this from some reading of Luke chapter 1. And if you go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 24, you can put this scenario together. And that is that Zacharias, who was the father of John the Baptist, was visited by an angel. And it was during the time that he served in the temple. Well, it says he served in the cycle of Abijah. And you can go back to, again, 1 Chronicles chapter 24, and you can see that there was, you know, the whole year was divided into different cycles that were assigned then to different priests and they would serve a couple of weeks at a time in the temple. And so the cycle of Abijah was in the winter time, and the cycle of Abijah was also in June, the month of June. And so if you then take the statement that Mary conceived in the sixth month of Elizabeth's carrying of the child John the Baptist, then you can see that um, you know, it's about six months after so it was either Mary conceived Jesus either in the winter time or in June. And so then you count nine months later and you come to either the spring or the fall. And so it shows that um, Christ was not born the winter time, but either the spring or the fall, and most likely in the fall season of the year. The shepherds are in the field, and the shepherds, of course, were a part of the uh, story of the birth of Christ. Christmas, as it is observed by most people, directly or indirectly breaks the Ten Commandments. And a lot of Christians haven't thought about this, but, you know, who are the central focus of this day? It's not God. It's not Jesus in a manger. No, it's Santa Claus. It's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It's Frosty the Snowman. And, of course, the Christmas tree, as we've just talked about. And so these things are not what God wants us to focus on at any time of the year. And so if you've got uh, you know, a bunch of ornaments in your front yard, if you've got uh, you know, these kinds of things that are set up, then they become the focus of your children's attention. Not Jesus Christ and not God the Father. And so that violates the first and second commandment because our focus is supposed to be on God. And we worship him. And, of course, we worship him in the name of Jesus Christ. Statistically, Saturday is the biggest shopping day of the year. And so, you know, a lot of people don't think about the fact that instead of observing the Sabbath and staying home, this is the big shopping day. And everybody's out, to, you know, doing what they want to do. Isaiah 58 says that we should not seek our own pleasure on the Sabbath day. But again, people have been convinced that uh, Sabbath is no big deal. 
that one day is as good as another. And that, of course, is simply not a biblical teaching. The observance of Christmas takes God's name in vain because it associates him with paganism. And again, would you want your name and your uh, being associated with something pagan? You know, imagine if your family and friends said to you, you know, I think we're going to celebrate your birthday on Hitler's birthday or Stalin's or maybe Mao Zedong's. And of course, these men are men of evil. And this day of worshiping the sun was a day of evil because God says we're not to worship the sun, moon, and stars. And yet a day of worshiping the sun was assigned to the birth of Jesus Christ. And so the whole season as it puts the focus again on all of these pagan accoutrements and practices, is a slam to God Almighty. It takes his name in vain when we say we're Christian, and yet we involve our lives around you know, these uh, pagan uh, ceremonies and rituals. You know, the fifth commandment, Christmas, gives kids really a material motive to obey their parents, doesn't it? You know, they're extra good during that time of year. And yet God wants us to obey our parents out of a deep respect and reverence for them. That's why it begins with the statement, honor your father and mother. Well, again, honor is not taught or inherent in the idea that, uh, you know, you're going to get presents no matter what, to, and you're going to be given this wonderful experience during that time of year. Retail crime goes up during the Christmas season. You know, it's the highest time of the year for murder. And that, of course, breaks the sixth commandment. And it's the biggest time of theft. And that breaks the eighth commandment. You know, a lot of families are very poor. And Christmas season comes around. And, you know, parents just feel like they, they have to steal in order to give their kids a Christmas that, you know, is at least comparable to what to all their friends have. And then, of course, we have the seventh commandment. And infidelity, of course, also skyrockets during this season of the year. There's all these Christmas parties that people attend, and they drink too much, and they make poor choices or decisions, and they end up sinning. And so then we have as well the ninth commandment. And, of course, the whole uh, celebration of Christmas, you could say, is built on a lie. And, you know, the ninth commandment is we're not to bear false witness. And so, you know, Jesus wasn't born on that day, December 25th. It is not a day established by God and his word. And so it's a lie. And so, again, it's not wrong to rehearse the birth of Jesus Christ. But why not do it in the fall or the spring when it was more likely to have happened and to occur? And you can rehearse and go through the gospel accounts you know, I try to give a sermon on that to at least uh, once a year and focus people's attention on it. So better is the day of one's death than the day of one's birth, says your Bible. And that's why we're commanded to commemorate the death of Jesus Christ, but we're nowhere commanded to again celebrate his birth. The New Testament church began on the feast of Pentecost. And God did that on purpose because he also calls his church the church of the firstborn. You can find that in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And so the Feast of First Fruits is the day of Pentecost, it's a different name for it, is to tell us and show us that God is beginning his church and beginning his kingdom with first fruits. That he's not trying to save everybody today. And if you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to YouTube and watch our program on eternal judgment. But God gave us the Feast of Pentecost to remind us that we're the elect, we're the chosen, we're the ones sanctified and set apart from the rest of the world until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And then, of course, under Christ's reign for a thousand years, there will be another harvest of Christian souls. And so we also have the Feast of Trumpets. And of course, Christianity would be, you know, would be greatly benefited by observing this day because the Feast of Trumpets rehearses all the trumpet blasts of the book of Revelation, including the seventh and final one 
at which time there is an announcement made that the kingdoms of this world are now the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And so the Feast of Trumpets points us to the future Jesus Christ, the return of Jesus Christ. And so you can see why that would be beneficial to observe, especially as we get closer to the time of the establishment of Christ's kingdom. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, you might know it by that name. Yom Kippur, of course, is a fast day, and it pictures the time in which two goats were you know, uh, brought before the high priest, and one was slain, symbolic of Jesus Christ, but the other had the sins of Israel confessed upon it, and, of course, then it was put into the wilderness alive. Well, again, the Bible shows that Satan has deceived the whole world. And so he's the one that is really behind our sins. And so we get the benefit of rehearsing that every year. And then, of course, we go on to the Feast of Tabernacles, and we picture the fact that this body, it's a temporary dwelling. It's not really, uh, you know, the life or the body that we're going to have for eternity. We're going to be given a new existence as spirit beings. So again, imagine if all of Christianity revolved around these festivals instead of Halloween, Christmas, Easter, St. Patrick's Day, and St. Valentine's Day, all of which were added without any authority to do so. So the original Christians observed these days, and they benefited greatly from it. It was an annual cycle of rehearsing the death of Jesus Christ, of rehearsing the birth of the church, of rehearsing the return of Jesus Christ and the chaining of Satan, and of course the establishment of Christ's kingdom where he tabernacles with men for a thousand years. And ultimately, the eighth day of that celebration points to the time in which God himself will come down to this earth, the new Jerusalem described in Revelation 21 and 22, descending to the earth and becoming the place, the central place of our focus. So that's God's plan in a nutshell. And again, we rehearse it every year in the observance of these festivals, as well we should. So doesn't that sound like a better cycle of worship than what maybe you've been practicing? If you want to learn more, you can go to OriginalChristianityReview.com or you can go to YouTube and type in the words Original Christianity. And you can find you know, some more programs about this subject. And you can see that the original Christians were not observing such days as Christmas and Halloween and Easter, but they were observing the festivals that God ordained, and for good reason, because they show us the Christ of the future. So think on these things, and again, cleanse yourself of everything pagan, because the Bible says we should do so, and let's become the holy people of God. And remember, if original Christianity was good enough for Jesus and the disciples, it should be good enough for you and me. Thanks for watching.